Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer Parker. I've got Doug Braun Harvey back with me today to kind of do a wrap up of the healthy sexual principles that we've been talking about. And we'll see whether or not this is our last one because <laughs> I'm, always, <laughs> I'm always excited to talk about something else as long as he'll have me. <laughs> Well, hello, but, Natasha. It's good to yeah. be back. Now, now, let me just do a, just a sentence, a sequence. Yes. It's, it's, it's sexual health and not healthy sexuality principles. And we can chat a bit more about why that's important, but the language sequence is important. Go for it. Well, healthy sexuality tends to be a more binary way of thinking. There are healthy ways of being and unhealthy ways of being. And so it sort of creates a kind of schism of one category of healthy and one category of not healthy. And that tends to be a very common way act-centered systems organize sexuality. There are approved of and disapproved ways of being sexual. So healthy sexuality, that phrase actually comes from that perspective, where sexual health is really a perspective of a kind of principled ideas that don't have a right or wrong there's sort of an agreement that they're essential fundamental ideas. And then each person has to figure out how do they relate to these ideas, not from a side taking or position taking solution that one's had us as a correct answer and one doesn't. So I find myself particularly interested in that sequence and and talking with sex therapists and other people that that languaging really makes a difference. I think that's really wonderful that we kind of inadvertently started that way. Because I think that goes into a lot of what we'll be talking about today are exactly what you just said. And I think that, yes, when you point that out, you know, the, the even just the term healthy sexuality has a feeling of moral overlay over it, right? So like you said, who gets to decide what's healthy? Okay. Um, and yeah. it's actually the question that got me started as a sex therapist. I wanted to know what is healthy sexuality? Mm-hmm. Am I being biased in the way that I look at healthy sexuality, you know, coming from Mormonism myself and my ideas about what it means to be a healthy sexual person. So having that turn around on us in a language perspective, granted, you know, you get a lot more questions and you get answers (laughs) as usual Uh in my training. Uh Uh (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's not, that's never ended. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and yet I think like you're saying, it allows for more freedom. It allows for more Mm self-authority. I think it allows for more partner authority for each, you know, each partnership is different. Each Mm -hmm. partnership is different and what might be considered edifying or healthy for one person is not always necessarily the case for the other. So it just allows for a lot more room. So I appreciate you starting us off with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I like about our conversation is that I could say this to you and it would be a welcomed exchange of contemplation, (laughs) you know, because I could certainly say this in other places, Natasha, and it would be the beginning of a a debate debate, or or, or it could be a distancing moment. How's that? Mm. Um, And what I've so enjoyed about our conversations is we've just had a, a mutual exchange that we're very interested in each other as having to say. And I just find that really, really refreshing. I've I've been speaking to people around the country and several people have been asking me, are the sexual health principles, how would these work in religious communities? And I said, well, I've been doing a six or seven part podcast on the sexual health principles and how they apply within the Mormon faith. And people are shocked. (laughs) <laughs> that I'm that not only I have an answer, but I'm actually involved in the conversation. I think that's wonderful. That's so and good. I, and I, I love being so able to happy play. that you feel that way about these interchanges with each other. So I've really enjoyed them as well. So, and one thing that I mean, because I can be feisty, you know, believe it or not, I can be debateful. <laughs> I, can mm-hmm. be, I can have strong opinions. So I'm glad that I'm not necessarily in that space with you. I'm, I'm really glad I'm able to be open to all of that. So thank you. Well, I I have watched you do this in the willingness kind of debate, and you're advocating to protect minors from non-consensual and exploitive dynamics 
within a ritual, within a religion. And I think those are really important conversations. Religious rituals are important and essential elements of all faith communities, but they also need to be held to standards of consent and non-exploitation. That, that's a universal sexual health principles that you know, some communities are not immune from. And I feel like you're really standing up to that conversation and saying these sexual health principles matter in those rooms too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the topic today is how do we handle, you know, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about the six principles. And so now it's about how do we handle it when these principles are either in conflict with one another or potentially even, you know, somebody doesn't agree with the principles or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And and I think that we've covered this a little bit here and there all along. And yet I thought it would be really interesting to spend a whole podcast on it. And I've thought through some scenarios that I definitely want to cover. And maybe you'll think of others where this tends to come up. But as I've been writing about sexual relationships for Boy, you know, like a decade now through my blog and things like that. A lot of times, even before I was aware of these particular principles, the way that you've languaged them, you know, I would write about things like honesty, you know, communication, trust, shared values, you know, these types of things that seem to make sense, you know, for most people if they want to have quote unquote healthy relationships or at least a relationships that are edifying to both partners. And oftentimes I would get pushback that it was too ideal. I was being too ideal. In other words, how did you hear that? What do you think the person was saying to you? Well, I think what they were saying is, well, sure, it'd be nice if I could communicate with my partner without them going, you know, off the rails and divorcing me. And, you know, if I'm really honest about my sexuality, it's going to be way too scary, or my partner isn't interested in that type of sexuality, or isn't interested in my history, or my history even will be part of uh, creating a wedge between us, you know, even in libido difference partnerships, you know, to be able to, for the high libido partner to be able to say, hey, my sexuality matters. That's not going to be okay with the low libido partner because now you're prioritizing sex over love or sex mm -hmm. over me or you're pressuring me, you know, and vice versa, that that argument can go the other way around. So it, it seemed like in a lot of these scenarios, people would push back and just say, well, Thanks for the answer, but that wasn't super helpful. So what I'm hearing, if I deconstruct a bit what you mean by pushback, and I went with your examples, is what I hear people saying to you is these principles are really you know, useful ideas, but they also have consequences. I think what they're saying by your being ideal is perhaps they're thinking we're not representing the consequences for living by these principles. And I hear each of those scenarios, the person telling you, here's the fallout of this. You know, here's the negative consequences from abiding by sexual health principles. And I think that that's real. You know, there are real consequences for upholding principles. And that's what I hear in all those stories. And so that the pushback might be what you're addressing here in today's conversation. Now let's look at the consequences. Yes. Uh, these, these, these are not just all good news stories. Yes. <laughs> because, because you embrace the, the principles of sexual health. And I think we have to kind of acknowledge that. There, you know, there's pain for living through sexual health. There's loss of love by abiding by sexual health. Not everybody's interested in living their framework of life through the principles of sexual health. And what do we do when there's that difference? Okay, I love that already. That's a very helpful framing because I agree it's not, maybe it's about realistic expectations. It's not just me saying, oh, you know, have shared values and you'll hold hands and run off into the rainbow, right? It's kind of like, here's a principle and there's a lot of work around this principle and this principle may have unintended consequences. And this is actually very apropos to the work I do in faith transitions. You know, when people, for example, have to face that decision about whether or not they're going to be honest about their belief system changing, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. with their spouse or with their community and the consequences that come with that. Because again, most of the time that doesn't go without consequences. You know, now some people handle that type of information better than others, but usually something shifts and that's very hard and why people remain quiet or silent oftentimes for decades, you know, before. So, so the solution to that. that conundrum is quiet. Silence. Right? Mm -hmm. Silence, right? So we could talk about what does that look like 
when people have conflicts in sexual health principles and their solution is silence. Yeah. What's the consequence of that decision? Right, because that's exactly right. It's not like one choice has consequences and one doesn't. That's right. Both have consequences. So, right. and in fact, there was just a research article I linked to somewhere, you know, when people hide their religious beliefs, that there's been a correlate to depression. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when people are trying to like fake it, right? So that they, mm -hmm. they don't, uh, and that makes sense. I mean, because you're not being your authentic self. You're not able to really talk about who you are and share your ideas and values with the people that matter the most to you. And so I silence, silence is, is not a, an infrequent solution to keeping mm -hmm. an attachment. You know, what we're really talking about is attachment keeping strategies. Mm. You know, if one's belief or values or ideas about life that are central notions of how they live change, and that change threatens primary attachments, you know, a lot of times people keep the attachment. Mm -hmm. You know, these are, these are the solutions that people come up with. Right. And there are consequences for that solution, just like there are consequences for the solution of being transparent about one's change in values and the potential loss and what I call the severing response, that the ultimate solution to these differences is to sever the relationship. And oftentimes in many systems, the severing response is a clearly stated option that can be utilized as a, prob a way to solve differences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I was at the ASECT uh, Winter Institute on Sexuality and Religion, and we looked at sacred scripture from a variety of uh, sacred texts from a variety of religions, it was interesting to see how in scripture, many times in these sacred texts, the solution to intractable sexual differences or violations of fundamental sexual laws, typically women's sexuality, you know, violating the laws of the religion of, of the land, was death. You know, which is a severing response. It's just another severing response. It's the That's most, nice it's, it's the most severe one there is. Right. But, but, it, but, but it, it's the ultimate severing response. Just like suicide is the ultimate severing response for the individual to direct inward. Mm. Suicide is the ultimate sexual is, is, is severing solution outward. But when end of life is presented as a solution to these intractable differences, it creates a different feeling for people. Hmm. And, and a, a less severe, that's the most severe, but a less severe is the loss of attachment, the severing of one's relationship with meaningful attachments. And for many people, that is really a serious consequence that is terrifying and fearful and in a, a level of pain that's beyond imagination. And people will do amazing things to hold on to their attachments. Sure. Well, we're wired for attachment, right? We're wired for our survival depends on attachment. And so there's reasons why we have that. I think a lot of times people self shame about that. Like I, I'm codependent or I shouldn't be that, you know, responsible for mm -hmm. feeling this way. And yet I think we're wired for that. Well, how people reward. maintain their attachments very widely, but I think sexual health principles and the struggling with, you know, aligning one's life with sexual health principles, one of the primary conflicts that will emerge is the loss of an attachment mm -hmm. by aligning oneself or moving towards more of an alignment with one of the sexual health principles. And I, one of them we just chatted about before the broadcast was, you know, this conflict between values and honesty. You know, when my values change, which you were talking about, and then my interest in wanting to have authentic and honest relationships. And then when I reveal and I'm transparent about these changes, a consequence could be the loss of the relationship. Right. Yeah. And that happens through divorce. It can happen through excommunication. You know, the church can do it to mm -hmm. you. It can happen uh -huh. through kind of family rejection, you know, where family members are ousted from being able to see their own family members, et cetera. So there's lots of different ways to do that. There's probably less drastic ways to do that as well, where people continue the attachment and yet maybe how they would describe it is there's a wedge there that they don't know how to get beyond. And so they're kind of cohabitating or mm -hmm. living roommates. You know, you often hear that the phrase from mm -hmm. couples that are frustrated with the lack of intimacy mm -hmm. um, that they're experiencing. So, yeah. So these are all, you know, big ideas, but I'm curious yeah. about what, what sort of ground on the ground situations. Yeah. Okay. So let's get started. Which, yeah. So my first one is more from the therapist perspective that I'd like to, and you know, and I came up with all these because quite frankly, I struggle with them. So I'm not saying that I have the best solutions or answers to these. And I've 
spent a lot of time thinking about them. So it's definitely had Pod- podcast as consultation. Yeah, this is transparent. Podcast consultation. <laughs> <laughs> I like your honesty. <laughs> Well, and I've taken strong positions on many of these things. And then, you know, and then I have to, you know, double back and say, well, am I being too rigid in my own thinking about some of these things? Just because, you know, I see the fallout or the consequences. So the first one has to do more with the therapists themselves. Mm-hmm. And the best way I can think about this is that there are certain scenarios that come through our office where... Because I think, you know, when you think about principles that a therapist is trying to negotiate, on the one hand, we're psychoeducators. So that's a role that we play. On the other hand, another role that we play is a validator, right? Or a person who is going to be safe for you to speak with about really whatever you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And then a third part of that, I think, is a recognition that even though we may have different values, I'm going to respect yours. Uh so those three things sound very nice and yet come into conflict with each other I think all the time so for example if I have a man in my office who says I really enjoy beating my wife get a lot of pleasure out of that and I believe that you know I have a right to do that the bible tells me so you know my interpretation of the bible anyway and I you know I don't see any issue with that and I would like for you to you know, help convince my partner here that that she should be okay with that, right? So that would be kind of a dramatic, I've I've actually never had that happen to me. Uh But I think that most therapists would probably not necessarily pick the principle of I'm going to respect your values. I think that they would pick the principle of psychoeducation. Uh And, you know, carefully and in a respectful way, maybe challenging some of those ideas and how they don't really fit with maybe the law or our, you know, Mm -hmm. other ideas of health in regards Mm -hmm. to mental health, et cetera. I see a lot less willingness from therapists to do this with sexual principles. And, and I wonder why, you know, and even with the idea of like, another, Can can you say a little more, I see less willingness for therapists to do this with sexual health principles. That's a great sentence. I'm curious what that means to you or what you observe. I think that we have a little bit more anxiety around sexuality in general. I think that we want to be very careful not to overstep in the values department when it comes to sexuality. Uh And I think we want to respect religion and religious differences. And Uh I'll even be very transparent that I'd probably be much more comfortable challenging my own religious values Uh than anybody else's. Uh So for example, if I had a couple who was Muslim in my office, I'd probably be much more willing to be curious or, you know, understand where they're coming from before I ever tried to challenge anything, which is appropriate because I don't come from that background Uh at the same time. So I guess what, what I'm getting at is that there are issues, in my opinion, that are just as harmful as the battering spouse Mm -hmm. within sexuality. For example, when we make something like masturbation a sin, Mm -hmm. when we make same sex relationships that are sexual a sin, when we have these types of ideas. Can can I read, can I, can I just interrupt? I want to see what it's like to rework those sentences. Okay. When we make masturbation a sin, I like to think about it from a relationship perspective. When I have aligned myself with a faith system that believes this sexual behavior is a sin. Yeah, so where I struggle with that, and I'll just tell you right away where I struggle with it, is that I don't necessarily see a 12-year-old child able to developmentally align themselves with a faith. I see them, and that's their culture, that's their family. I mean, maybe when you're 40, you know, or 45, and you can finally start saying, okay, I'm choosing to stay in this religion, or I'm choosing to continue to align myself with these ideas that maybe now I have the developmental ability to challenge at some level. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that I see religious belief, at least at first, as a choice, as much as a cultural framing Mm-hmm. that you are born into for the most part. Right. And then this, this is true out. for everybody in the world. Yes. Okay. So that's my only pushback about the word aligning with. 
Okay, so then we have to think about what is the consequences for parents choosing to align their parenting sexual health values with the religion they are living in? And are they thinking about the consequences that has for their child's development? You know, and what happens when your religious beliefs might be in conflict with what you believe are maybe not so useful sexual health messages for a child? You know, I mean, so so in other words, if it is a 12 year old, then, then we have to look at the parents. I mean, you know, I think you're right. At what point does a child begin to make some differentiated, you know, kind of ideas about the religion they've been given versus the one they envision for themselves to have as they go right. forward. So I, I think it's a parenting issue then possibly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think what I'm hearing you say, and, and you tell me, I mean, I, I think for me, for a long time, it felt like the message I was getting from other professionals is, well, you, sh- you don't really have the right to challenge those ideas because you have to meet them where they're at, or you have to respect their values. And I think what I've learned from listening to you is that you can do a bit of the yes and you can respect their values. You can be very, you know, respectful in the process of listening to them and why these things are important to them. And you can also point out the consequences, which is different. It's different to be a therapist saying, hmm, I think you are raising your child incorrectly and in a damaging way. That would be a very direct challenge which is not or, or, or what I would call a, or what I would call a judgment. Right. And it's not appropriate even within therapy practice to be direct in that way. I mean, we kind of know our ethics around that versus an invitation like, okay, so this is what I hear is important to you. And at the same time, can I share some psychoeducation with you? Or can I share some statistics about what we know about, you know, gay kids who are raised in religious homes or some of the consequences to some of these choices as, mm-hmm. as far as your parenting. I mean, is that? Yeah, I, th- I think where I start with these kind of conversations is I ask the client who's presenting me with these kind of intractable conflicts, how did they come up with this plan? When did you decide this was the way you were going to approach this situation? So I hold the adult first accountable that this is, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, they've made a decision to approach life, this life circumstance with this, what I call treatment plan. When did you come up with this treatment plan? (laughs) And what are you seeing as the benefits and the downsides of this treatment plan? And usually people are coming to me in my office to talk to me about these treatment plans because they're not happy with the outcomes of the treatment plan. Right. And And I think that's a, a I like the idea of offering a responsibility and accountability to people. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think, especially coming from religious backgrounds, it's so easy to give that authority away. Well, it's because it's not my treatment plan. It's God's treatment plan, right? It's, I I didn't make these decisions. I'm just following God. Well, are you happy with God's treatment plan? Right. (laughs) I mean, if you're good with it, then what are we here? Why why are you here? I mean, you know, so, okay, we can also have conflicts with God's treatment plan. (laughs) It's it's life. Right. (laughs) Yeah, and I, I think that there is benefit in, having to sit back and think about that, you know, yes. instead of just, you know, pushing the, the buck over to God, I guess. Right. <laughs> even, even if it is God's treatment plan, an adult has chosen to uh, go along with it. Unless God has the ability and the power to kind of against all will force you to follow his will. And you you have no power or authority to have any differentiated response. Now, I don't know, maybe some people feel that's the way it works. I don't know. Yeah, I think some do. At the okay. same time, it's complex because usually these treatment plans are coming through the mouth of men who are interpreting God's plan, right? Mm-hmm. So that's where it gets, I think, a little tricky, or I hope people would be willing to think about that anyway. But again, I think the central narrative you're bringing here is that for some reason, the person's not happy with the way things are working. Mm-hmm. And what is their vision? What are they, what, if, you know, this is where I like to ask, what's your vision of sexual health? You know, okay, here's what you're not happy with. Where are you headed? What's, what are you, what's the vision for you? Right. Okay. Not, not so much mine. So before I move past this, then, as far as the central question of how therapists deal with what we might consider as far as standard best practice, when people come in with sexual stories that go against sexual best practice, Mm -hmm. what would you say as far as my thoughts on how we intervene? I like to use my 
personal experience as a therapist before I insert the authority of research. I might say something like, you know, well, I've been doing this for quite a few years. And the solution you're proposing is one I've never seen work before. <laughs> well, you, you know, you could be the first. It's okay. You know, there's always first. But, you know, the particular solution you're proposing to me, I've not ever seen work. And so, I, I, you know, help me understand how you think it's going to work. Because I've never seen it. You know, I, I have a small office and I only see a few people. So I'm not saying I've got all the answers, but in this office, what you're proposing, I've not seen work. Yeah, that's a great one. I, I just, so, so, I just, so I just own it as my experience rather mm -hmm. than pull in the authority of research first. What's your thinking about that? Why is one better than the other? Or why would you go with one? Because therapy is ultimately a relationship between people. Mm -hmm. And the relationship between therapist and client has been shown to be such an important healing vehicle. So if I bring like a triangulation and bring the authority of a researcher into the room, much like the client's bringing the authority of the church, we're not meeting together, just the two of us. I like that. Yeah. I'm so interested it, in meeting with the person in the room. And so what I am, I'm this therapist who sat in this office and had these conversations with people so I can authentically represent my experience. And the client is authentically representing theirs. So let's meet there first. Yeah, I like that. So it's less clinical, less cold. There's something warmer about the process. Not that you're saying don't ever bring up research, but right. not, but the, uh, not, not start there. Let's yeah. start with our relationship first. Yeah, no, I like that. And who you've hired as a therapist, and this is who I am, and this is my experience. So let's be transparent and honest. This is who you got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that whole thing of that. I haven't seen that work just a few weeks ago. I'm not going to share with what situation because it'll probably be too obvious who it was. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. No, confidentiality is good. Yes. <laughs> when you're a podcaster. Right. And, and, you, and you have clients. <laughs> and you have clients. <laughs> right. That's funny that you say that because I said that and I remember kind of chuckling at myself and I think it was funny. I think I said it in a funny way. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, well, you know, and it can be delivered that way. It can be important too, because there's an irony to it. Yeah. When, when human beings like to challenge what I call the laws of physics, we need to <laughs> humor. <laughs> That's right. Okay, good. All right. So let's move on then to some of what I think are very common maybe complaints that I get that just present. And, and I think the conversation again will be similar, but it's uh -huh. nice to just kind of visualize this actual problem and then have a similar conversation around it. Mm -hmm. The one that I get that's very common is the sexless marriage, mm -hmm. where one person is, you know, not having the frequency of sex that they'd like. And, 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 and more than that, I mean, really it qualifies as a sexless marriage, which I think the current understanding of that is like, having sex maybe less than 10 times a year mm -hmm, mm -hmm. around yeah. that frequency. And one person's perfectly comfortable with that scenario and arrangement and one person isn't. Or the only reason why maybe one person is not comfortable with that scenario is because the other person's complaining about it on a regular mm. basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but in other words, one person doesn't have really the desire to have more sex. And let's say that other than that, their relationship is fairly okay. You know, they parent well together. They, enjoy maybe traveling together. They have some shared hobbies or interests. They get along fairly well. They consider themselves friends. Mm -hmm. But here's, the, you know, so the rest of the relationship isn't so dire that the motivation for severing, like you said, is not high. You know, I don't want to necessarily divorce. So oftentimes I'll see it. Well, I'll see several scenarios from this dilemma. Mm -hmm. One is that the high libido partner just sells himself short and sometimes dramatically so. Because again, if, if your idea of the religion is you can't even masturbate or have any solo type of sex, they just become sexless themselves, even though it's not there. Well, well what I call uh, become sexless if solo sex is not on the map is they retreat to the world of nocturnal emissions. Okay, there you go. Eventually, the body will release sperm and semen. It has to. It keeps producing it. And there will be nocturnal emissions, and, and people will have an emission during sleep. And that is their sex life. Right. And I've seen that in women as well, where they have orgasms in their sleep, or they'll have fantasy dreams mm -hmm. that they feel like you know they don't have a lot of control over, and even wonder if they're doing something wrong by having some of those dreams. So their sex life is in their dream state. Right. And nowhere else. Right. So I'm going to tangent really quickly. <laughs> 
because there was a little pamphlet given out to the young men back in the 70s by a church leader of ours where he called, you know, your body the little factory, mm-hmm. the new sperm, and mm-hmm. it, you didn't have to masturbate and you didn't have to have sex because this is what would happen. You'd have right. internal emissions. Mm-hmm. So this whole idea that masturbation is healthy or that, you know, you'd want to have sexual release there's no need for that. So I just say that because as you said that, I'm like, oh no, now there's going to be people who are like, see, that was right all along, even though we kind of have poo-poo. Well, here's, here, but, but here we like have- That pamphlet isn't in rotation anymore is what I want to say. Right. right. What underlies the assumption in that argument is that the development of understanding one's body and its ability for pleasure is not completely out of that solution. Right. As, as if the only solution is the, the uh, elimination of body fluid- instead of the pleasure component of sexual health, which is the body is designed for pleasure. Yeah. And what do we do with that? No, I agree. I just want to mention that because I don't want to give the wrong impression that somehow Packer was correct. (laughs) Right, right. And this is what I love about our conversation because you have all that history. I just say these things and you're like, well, wait a minute. Oh no. Yeah, right, right, right. So that's what I really enjoy about our conversation. I, I, I would never have any knowledge of that. Right, right. Okay. So, yeah, so they either will not masturbate or they will masturbate and even maybe look at sexually explicit materials, but then in secret, because mm-hmm. that's not considered okay, you know, or they feel like their spouse would be. So they can't be honest. They can't be honest about it. Right. So now the honesty principle is, you know, is there. They may not be able to be honest about their own desire. They might even be not even saying that, hey, I'm not happy with the frequency of our sex life. Mm -hmm. So honesty kind of plays a big role in all of this. And then to the point where some people even go further than that, right? Have an affair or some type of other relationship, whether that's physical or emotional or Mm -hmm. through chatting or sexting, you know, the many ways that people connect these days. So that's a very typical kind of scenarios, the sexless marriage, you know, stemming from libido differences or desire discrepancies mixed in with a lot of ideas about sex in general, you know, that sex usually in in our religion, although important, is not as important as the relationship. Yeah. Right. And because that would be you being worldly or being, or giving into the natural man. So yeah, it kind of sets up this scenario for a lot of anguish for both partners or sometimes one partner doesn't know that there should be anguish involved because they just don't know they're not in the know of what's going on so one of the ways i think about hearing i'm I'm sort of listening to my mind as i'm listening to you describe the scenario and i keep coming back to the word pleasure and that in a sexless marriage i think one of the things the couple and each individual in the couple has to think about is where do they stand with the sexual health principle of pleasure where is that in their vision of sexual health What are the current sources of pleasure? Are they satisfied with the sources of pleasure they're having in life? So rather than talking about frequency of sex or sexual relations or activity, I find it kind of creates a different kind of conversation when it's about the principle of pleasure and that there might be differences in how each values pleasure, how much wanting pleasure from each other or with themselves. And these may be changes over time, but this avoidance of a conversation about pleasure and sources of pleasure is sort of another narrative for couples to sit in and be contemplative about. Because often in that, notice if you look at the whole way you've described that situation to me, the word pleasure wasn't mentioned. Mm -hmm. And yet I think that's a significant sexual health principle that's embedded in that entire story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the challenge there for many is, um, and I don't even think this is a Mormon problem. I think this is a puritanical problem that we don't prioritize pleasure. You know, pleasure is kind of a secondary, it's not as important, right? I mean, you think about the work ethic of the typical American, for example, (laughs) it's just, it's not as important. Like, sure, if we get to that, great, you know, but we can't like prioritize our life around that Mm because that would be silly almost or superfluous or some, you know, some type of values that we have around pleasure being not as important. And maybe this is where I think some people just struggle with sex being important. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole idea of having sexual principles, Mm -hmm. sexual health principles is like, well, but 
that's fine if you like sex, but if you don't, it's not that important. I wish the listeners could see you because we're talking on camera to each other. Your body and your hand motions and your shoulder, it's all dismissiveness. All of your nonverbal communication that we're talking was what I'm really hearing you say is when people are faced with these conflicts around pleasure based on cultural norms in American society, which is beyond even one's religion, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then they, they combine in this culture, in this country, a solution to these dilemmas is to be dismissive, mm-hmm. to, to go to the attachment style <laughs> of a dismissive response in a relationship. And the dismissive response is one of not anxiety. They just avoid. So if you listen to the tone of your voice and the way you describe these kind of solutions people have, they're not pained. They're not anguished. They're not anguished. It's just like, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> you know. And so that's the avoidant response without anxiety. I think some of the clients you're describing, that avoidant response is starting to be a little more anxiety producing. Mm. And Missiveness isn't working so well. Yeah. And so that's what they're sort of having to kind of maybe try to figure out what to do in the therapy office when these dismissive kind of styles are no longer an acceptable solution. Right, right. All right, next scenario that I'll put Mm -hmm. on the table is one maybe more where there's a dynamic of oppression. So for example, very typically in our culture, women have stayed home to raise children, have not necessarily developed their own careers or ability to, you know, take care of themselves financially if needed. Uh And now they find themselves in a situation where, you know, it's a less than ideal relationship or marriage. So oftentimes they're telling me like sex isn't even my first priority. Like that's, you know, I'm just trying to survive, you know, this relationship. I don't believe in divorce. I don't want to break up my family. I don't even know how I would take care of myself if I were to divorce or take care of the kids or maybe at least being married. I have more control over whether or not he would be harmful to the kids. Whereas, you know, if now we're having to do joint custody, I have less control. So I'm willing to, in a sense, self-sacrifice, right? So these are the things that people tell me. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to sex, yeah, I just kind of do my duty and, you know, like make sure he's happy and as long as I can keep that up, then we're going to be okay. And, and what is the client bringing to you? Is there a conflict? That may be the situation. I don't know if they have a conflict. Well, oftentimes I think the conflict is that, you know, she's drowning in this scenario, right? So she's feeling, even though she's telling me that, you know, as I'm challenging and going, well, do you have other options? And she's telling me no, she's still telling me that she's incredibly unhappy. Um, and, 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 and do you have a sense of, what the primary sources of unhappiness are if we were to look through the lenses of sexual health <laughs> principles is it that she has been unable to be honest about this and so the therapy office is the first time she can sit in a room and just be honest not change mm-hmm. not not do anything differently mm-hmm. just have one place where this part of her life is given <sighs> voice yes and to and respected that may in and of itself it's not it's the solution, but it's a mm-hmm. start She's moving mm-hmm. towards the honesty sexual health principle, which might be, you know, a start. Yeah. Or she might be using the therapy office to sort out her values. This is the solution she's come up with to, at this point in her life. Perhaps something shifted in her value structure where this accommodation, this solution to these myriad of conflicts and solutions that she's come up with in a very kind of, you know, idiosyncratic, personal way, something's shifted. Can she identify what that is? What value has changed? What has shifted? Can she give that voice? Can she identify the value that might be different? And now that that value is different, does she see herself going back to the way it was? Or does she now have to configure her life that this new value is kind of now set? And this is kind of who she's going to be going forward. So now which parts of her treatment plan have to be reconfigured? Because this value is now a permanent part of how she understands herself to be. And therapy can be a place to sort all of this out. Meanwhile, the entire life circumstance you've described hasn't changed. Right. So the therapist has to, I think, be careful about what I call premature movement to action. Or, you know, hearing these stories, you know, might think that we have to move to other solutions other than those might be early alignment with certain principles of sexual health, even though she may be unaligned with others, like her pleasure is certainly not at all on the landscape. And that may come later. 
Right, right. Yeah, and I think that's what my hope in having this discussion with you is just to point out to people that your particular situations, you know, like, I guess I want to just normalize this idea that you may be prioritizing one principle over another for good reasons, right? Yes. And that it may not be completely realistic today to have all of these principles aligned, you know, in your life or to feel that they're all having equal say in your life yeah. um, and that you may want to move in that direction or you may not even, you know, maybe there are people who are like, I'm perfectly, you know, I, I had, um, well, actually I've had several gentlemen, for example, in the scenario of kind of the prior example where, you know, they're in their seventies and they've been in a sexless marriage for 25 years and they love their wife and they're like, there's no way I'm going to leave her. You know, mm-hmm. she has, mm-hmm. she has nothing without me financially. We love each other. We've got grandchildren together, mm-hmm. but yeah, I'm seeing an escort on the side, right. Or I'm masturbating and looking at porn on the side and they have really zero desire to shift that. That just kind of comes. It's not the reason why they're coming to see me, right. it comes up in our conversation, right. but it's not the reason why they're not wanting to change that. They're there for other reasons. So I just want to, and, but and again, I don't want to say that's but, wrong or right. I just want to yes. say that's how they've negotiated these types of values and principles. And one of the things that might be interesting if a client were to do that with me is I might pause for a minute and say, how many people have they ever told that to? As mm-hmm. matter of fact, as you told me. And was there something you were wanting from me in telling me that? Or was there something you were sort of had thought maybe you were concerned might happen if you told me that? You know, that I find that kind of, that's the honesty sexual health principle. So sometimes just slowing down and acknowledging that somebody's moved into that space of honesty, whether it's a conflict or not, and in this case, it would not be a conflict, but nonetheless, he has moved to a more honest kind of relationship with you around an aspect of his sexual health. And in some ways, what he seems to be saying to the therapist is, my relationship with my pleasure is still there, even though it's not in this marriage. And here's the solution I've come up with. And I'm not conflicted with it. Right. And, and right. What's, that, what's that like to represent that in psychotherapy? Right. Yeah. And, it's, and I think it's difficult because a lot of times our values as a society or our values as a therapist might you know, be contra- you know, like, well, we believe in the value of honesty in relationships, right? Or we believe in the value of, so this is where you get a lot of different, even therapist styles. And But what I hear, but I hear in that statement, I believe in the value of honesty. I think there's actually something being hidden in that sentence. Mm -hmm. Yes, they believe in the value of honesty, but they, that person who's saying that has a threshold that they believe the honesty value has been met. And the client is not is under that threshold, mm-hmm. whatever, however the therapist defines it. Right. And in some therapy circles, there's almost a fetishizing of absolute complete honesty as the mm-hmm. only acceptable threshold. Right. And then other psychotherapy disciplines or other psychotherapists may have different thresholds of what is the, this threshold of, of honesty, minimum honesty to meet the sexual health principle. Whereas I'm a bit more client-centered. You know, is this a sufficient level of honesty for you in how you live your life? Right. And they chose to be honest with me. How did you choose to do that? Why did you want that to be honest here? And yet in other relationships, you don't. You're evidently doing some algorithm here. And I'm curious about what your algorithm is. You know, so it's the client's threshold for honesty and the consequences of what that threshold of honesty is. That I think is an important psychotherapy conversation rather than the therapist having a level of honesty that the client has to arbitrarily align with. Right. Which is what we see a lot with the issues I see come up with, for example, sex addiction treatments or infidelity treatments where, you know, as part of the treatment protocol, the person who has betrayed the spouse or the betrayer, however you want to language that. The one who hasn't kept the agreement. The one who hasn't kept the agreement is, you know, kind of told by the therapist oftentimes that they have to come clean, that there has to be this huge disclosure, you know, and that disclosure is usually very detailed. And so now there's a lot more, again, room or potential for secret keeping again, (laughs) because that's typically the story I get, you know, later down the road is that that first disclosure wasn't a complete disclosure the way that maybe the person who thought they were getting disclosed to you know, so it just opens up a lot of, I think, 
variabilities. And I guess the reason why I think it's important to talk about this is that people know that depending on who you go to to do therapy with, you might get a very different approach to some of these. So I would encourage anybody who sees a therapist who states in a very absolute, certain, confident, fairly uh, set manner in which honesty and levels of honesty are to occur in therapy for there to be any hope for change. It might be interesting for the client to say, how did you decide that this was the route forward for all clients? Because I think the dilemma I have with these kinds of strategies or trainings is that they tend to be broad brushed and seem to be putting the therapist in the position of applying this strategy in all circumstances. And I think that's the danger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm that I think there are too many individual circumstances that need to be considered before a broad brushed kind of general approach is sort of placed upon the couple. And I think there's, now let's deal with the exploitive dimension of sexual health. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I think there's an exploitive dimension to this on the part of therapy. You know, these are people who are scared, who are hurt, who are terrified of losing their marriage. People are, have been discovered if not keeping the agreement. And the power dynamics have shifted so, you know, just tremendously overnight because of the disclosure. And oftentimes somebody wanting to stay in the marriage will not see themselves as any agency or power at all. And that the, the injured party, the party that thought the agreement was being kept, that had been exploited for years, now, you know, wants to regain the power. And so when they enter into therapy and the therapist also has has this powerful position of saying, here's the way it works. Here's what you need to do here. You know, this is the way to have hope. There's also an exploitive dimension possibility of that, that the client isn't really being given enough time to contemplate some of the consequences of these very influential interventions that can resonate for the rest of the life of a marriage forever. Mm -hmm. These are not benign interventions. You know, before you go and do surgery, you tell people what all the consequences of the surgery could be. Right. And I don't know if I see therapists taking enough responsibility for slowing things down because oftentimes I think therapists and everybody gets believes that they're in the middle of a sex emergency and there's no such thing as a sex emergency. They don't exist. People are scared. That's true. Uh, people are terrified. People are hurt. People are angry. People are enraged, but that's not a sex emergency. You know, we have to kind of be careful about when we move in a very authoritarian position to assert some sort of threshold of honesty that's a very high standard that is done very early in the clinical relationship. And this is often the case in inpatient treatment programs. Right? Yes. No, I am yeah, fully aware. What would you say are, you know, people might say, well, what's wrong with honesty? What's wrong with information? What's wrong with, you know, what, what could possibly go wrong with disclosure of information? Well, there's five other sexual health principles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honesty is not standing out there all by itself without any other interlinked to other sexual health principles. That's right. Yeah. What is the consequence of this honesty for the future of pleasure in this couple? What values might be met or not met by this full transparency? Right. What, what dimensions of exploitation could possibly be, you know, occurring? Yeah. And I, especially the pleasure one, that's when I talk with couples oftentimes in infidelity, you know, do you really want all this information swimming around in your head, you know, 10 years from now when you're, you know, past this initial hurt and really wanting to connect, it's sometimes not useful to have every single detail. Plus, you know, there's privacy principles too. So. And there's some research to support this, that the erotic life that's sustained over the course of a relationship needs to have some mystery. Mm hmm you have to reach across the other in a some space of mystery. Yeah. And in the name of treatment for sex addiction, what's happening to the erotic potential and life of the partners going forward? And how is that taken into consideration? You know, it's like prostate surgery for prostate cancer. They used to not really be on the up and up with men about the consequences for sexual functioning before mm -hmm. the surgery because they were so paranoid and scared of the, of the cancer. And they're getting better about saying, well, look, you know, here's what could happen. You know, and some men go, okay, I'm going to watch this for a while. I'm not going to run right into surgery. So people are, it's, it's a collaborative exchange rather than a top-down kind of potentially exploitive situation because people are terrified. Talk a little bit about how it can become exploitative in this situation that we're talking about with infidelity as that, far that, as wanting information from an honest perspective. That the therapist doesn't slow everybody down. 
and I have the responsibility of seeing the power dynamics in the couple. A very human response to this kind of betrayal is to want to reclaim as much power back as possible. That's human, that's very real, but that's, that's temporary. It's, you know, this is not the way the couple's, if the couple's going to go on in the future and endure, this current power shift is not permanent. It's a response to pain. And so we have to think, the therapist has to be thinking a little bit more long-term for the couple, much like a physician would have to think more long-term for the patient around the particular interventions and treatment that they're proposing. And so I think the therapist has a responsibility to slow things down, educate clients what they're really looking at and what the pros and cons of this particular intervention may be. And I don't see that being proposed in the full disclosure approach. What I often hear is that any ambivalence about full disclosure is seen as loss of hope for the treatment outcome. Yeah. And I guess I would even say that sometimes it can become exploitative from the injured party. In other words, not that they're meaning to be exploitative, but because like you're saying, it's coming from this place of hurt. But when it's like, you know, this other person now has zero power, I hold all the power. If I don't get the information or if I don't get you to act the way I want you to act, then, you know, here's this consequence of me laying down the hatchet on the relationship. So there's right. some... The, sever, the severing response will be used yes. as a threat to assert the power to get as much information as they want. And that can be a really hard thing to hear if you're already injured and now on top of it, you know, you're being kind of cautioned about that type of thing. <laughs> so that's really hard. All right. The last scenario I'd like to kind of put on the table. And then I, you know, of course I'm open to your ideas too, as far as what maybe I'm not bringing to the table is the LGBT community, right? So this is oftentimes in many, many religions, obviously there's the issue of the values. And again, I know we've talked about this in the past, but it's so incredibly, uh, I guess, insidious to me, right? So it's, it feels so difficult to me to be able to honor the values where this comes from, because I feel like it's just so damaging to the people who are having to negotiate these values. So I tend to get angry at the system, right? And I know you're going to pull me back to the individual, yes. <laughs> which is yeah. good. You're, yeah. yeah, you're catching on to my one trick pony here, Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the most common scenarios I see are one, well, this is a very typical kind of storyline. So a youth will come in, you know, somewhere between the ages of 12 and 19 and start discussing that this is even an issue for them. And there's oftentimes been something ahead of that to, you know, either grades are dropping, they're cutting themselves, they're suicidal, they're, you know, having panic attacks. Typically the presentation that I've seen is that they're high achievers. You know, they're the types that are like doing everything right to try to somehow tie into that equation that if I do everything right, this will go away, right? So God will bless me and take this away from me if I do everything right. So they're high achievers. They're usually very involved in the church community and they have a sincere testimony, right? So they believe these things. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a very typical. In fact, they may need to believe them more than other people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they believe it. The high high stakes here. So they're they're, they're heavily invested in heavily invested, heavily invested because the outcome is essential. Yes. Yes. And then the, you know, again, the typical person who shows up in my office, there may be plenty of people who never show up to the office. And so they just, you know, they go about it a different way, but somewhere between, you know, their early twenties and their forties, something happens where the status quo doesn't work anymore. Now, by this point, they might be in a mixed orientation marriage. They may have gone on a mission. They may be trying to date or they might try to the celibacy approach, right? Or they're going ahead and having same-sex relationships, but with a lot of guilt, you know, a lot of self-loathing. So something is, you know, they're constantly in conflict with some aspect of themselves. Mm -hmm. And usually by the age of 40, 45, what I typically see at that point is the F the church approach, you know, like, I can't believe I've spent my entire life in this horrific kind of stance and sadness. And now I'm, you know, super angry with the church. I'm, I'm leaving the church. 
I'm potentially leaving my mixed orientation marriage. I, you know, maybe have these children now. So there's just kind of this implosion type of thing that happens, you know, in midlife where, you know, reclaiming themselves is is really becoming a very important part of their journey. Mm -hmm. So that's one presentation, right? So obviously there's the people who stay in mixed orientation marriages. There's people who continue to believe, even though they don't feel like they can muster, you know, the, the activity of it. There's people who still go to church and are even with their same sex partners, even though they may experience disciplines. I mean, there's all different kinds of scenarios, but to me, it's just the story of constant turmoil, sadness, which I'm going to propose to you, the constant turmoil and sadness is when the solution to these dilemmas is an attempt to abide by one sexual health principle at the sacrifice of another. And that trade-off over time for some people longer is worth it. In other words, the question that I wrote here as I was listening to you is, which disappointment is the person willing to live with? And they've been willing to live with one disappointment, and maybe that equation has changed. And that disappointment is no longer tolerable for them. Yeah, and this is why I'm so angry at the system, right? Because I feel like the system places people in this position. It's not like us straight people are in this position, right? We don't have to struggle with these positions, you know, or wonder which principle we have to choose or align ourselves with because we're not even placed in that position. Well, they so may not have been, maybe about not orientation, but other in other ways, these kinds. Yes, in other ways, yes. Yeah, but not about object, you know, desire and, and who you're, you know. Right, which, of course, of that. is such an integral part of people's, you know, identity and mm-hmm. self. And so this is where I just feel like it's an abusive system that people are trying to navigate. So that becomes mm-hmm. where I get more, may provocative in my language or... Well, again, what I would encourage you as a therapist to think about is, is that germane and helpful to the client to have the therapy space be one that creates a clearer narrative about the system that they've been living within and the consequences of aligning their self with that system? And perhaps for whatever reason, that's now less tenable for them and how painful that is. And I, I particularly, you said, you know, not everybody comes to therapy for these moments. I think it might be interesting for the therapist to think about what is this sub cohort of people? What do they have in common that they seek out therapy at this time in life where other people don't? What makes them different? Why are they coming to a, a psychotherapist as a part of this stage of life conflict? I don't know the answer to that one, but it's kind of interesting, isn't it? That, you know, I, I, that got my attention. Well, not everybody goes to a therapist for this, but the people who do, why are, why are they coming to a therapist and going someplace else? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and unfortunately, I think sometimes, especially at, at first as adolescents or as parents of adolescents, they're coming because they want you to somehow cure this or change this to figure out a way where, you know, you don't have to be gay or lesbian or transgender or bi or any of those things. So the mental health field has been complicit for years, the mental health field, and to some degree, just by the fact that it didn't refute it, promoted the idea that they could perform erotic ectomies through psychotherapy. And that false promise remains as a hope for some people. And that's on the mental health field. They promoted this idea. Which leads me full circle to the first question I asked, which is when does a therapist say that's not going to (laughs) work versus sure, I'll meet you where you're at and let's work on a goal that is against best standard. Well, I I guess it would be the same thing as if you're working with a psychotic patient. When do you help a client have a a reality check, you know, get them grounded in reality. And, And I think there's a responsibility as a therapist to not let a client sit with delusional thinking in front of you and not address the fact that there's delusional thinking in the room. Or paranoid thinking or, Okay, so would you agree that that's a struggle when it comes to religious values? Because calling a religious value delusional thinking. No, no, the the religious value is not the delusional thinking. The idea that there's solution to that religious value conflict, that's the delusion. That I, as a therapist, can provide you this particular outcome because of your religious values. That's the delusional thinking. That their religious value can be whatever it wants to be. I'm not here to discuss that. I'm here to discuss what they're wanting from me, not from their religion. What they're wanting from me is to resolve their conflict with their religion by 
changing their sexual orientation or, or at least resolving the desire and intensity of it enough that they're no longer in pain over it. Yeah. And the reason I'm, I'm kind of pushing back is it's just, I can hear the voice, you know, I can hear the, the pushbacks that I get on the other side of the couch. Right. So in other words, if I was to say, you know, that's not something I can help you with, there's still, I guess what I mean by the delusional thinking is that if your belief is that God can cure this quote, you know, you can not see my quote unquote signs that I'm throwing all over the place. And you come to a therapist who says, well, that doesn't work. Well, I might say God can't do it through me. I don't know where yeah, God, God does can't it, do but it not me. in this room. Right, not in this room. They may, of course, then fire you, which is fine. People can yeah. fire their therapists, and they'll go find a therapist who, in my position, is unethically willing to promise that or to offer that type of solution Yeah. when we don't have the research to back that up or evidence. Right. Every, every healthcare system has its charlatans. You know, people go to doctors who provide all sorts of false promises. The mental health field is not immune from this. Oh, no, and, not at and all. And some people go to them for hope, particularly when they're desperate. I mean, this is not new. This is not a new story. I think it's just hard for us as mental health professionals to realize we have colleagues who engage in this and, and make money from it. It's right. painful. You know, so when I've had people in this situation, the one thing I have said is I, I have informed them of what the research shows. This is where I will assert research and said, you know, you can certainly go for sexual reorientation therapy, or you can invest in these programs that therapists offer. You can do that. And if it's in California, I'd say, by the way, that's against the law for that to be provided in California. So you might have to go to another state. Isn't uh, it just for a minor though? Or is it also for adults in California? I don't know. I think it's only for minors. Okay. It it's might be, it might be only for minors. I don't know this. I don't know the law, but I think what's important here is just to sort of let people know that the research shows this actually has enormous health consequences that harm people even more. And that I have a responsibility to let you know that the procedure you're interested in going through, the research shows harms people. You can still do it. You're, you know, you're an adult. You can do whatever you want. But I, I, have a, I don't feel ethically good in our relationship having you leave this room and not tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, you know, again, those kinds of things seem to come up for me with things like the sexual addiction model, sexual shame in general, you know, mm -hmm. through religious lenses. This is where it just gets very complicated because I'm not wanting to go against people's values. And yet we see over and over again, the harm that comes from some of the ways that people interpret their religion or sexuality through their religion. And so that's the constant area of tension and why this whole, you know, a conversation with you has been so useful because it gives some framing on how to challenge some of those ideas or at least invite conversation or dialogue or inner critical thinking through some of these principles as we struggle to, you know, be aligned with our religion or our faith, if that's something that's important to us, and at the same time also be aligned with health and sexuality and yes. things that are important in that realm as well. And I really appreciate you talking about the amount of pain you sit with when people are in dire conflict with both of these desires, you know, and you, you really sit with people in this space far more than I do. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why I need to do my own work on anchor management <laughs> Right, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I think you have some compassion with yourself is that you're asking yourself to sit in a space with humanity that's a space even our own country doesn't know how to do for the most part. You're really trying to do something that is really hard for most people to figure out how to do. Yeah, well, I so appreciate your willingness to have these conversations with me. It's, it's been very personally helpful and I think also, I hope, will be helpful to many as they're trying to navigate these either inner dialogues or relational dialogues with mm -hmm. the things that matter to them. Yeah, it's been interesting today how the more we've gotten into the details, the more you've invited us into, you know, a world of pain. Mm. It is. It is painful when I see people, you know, as you were talking about pain, I can see several of, for instance, you know, a lesbian couple, a gay couple, like in sob sobbing on my couch, you know, just 
facing excommunication for their choice to get married, you know, facing family, you know, expulsion due to the coming out process. And, and when that is done in the name of my God, that is, yeah, something I struggle with. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, you, you have a different position than I do as a therapist in those moments. Yeah. Because of who you are and how you live your life and where you, where you come from. Yeah. So thank you so much mm-hmm. for this experience. That's well, and, I, it's been an honor for me too. I, I, <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I am when I get to tell people when they ask me about religion and sexual health, I said, well, you know, I've been doing a podcast series with a Mormon therapist and we've been talking about the principles and they relate to the Mormon religion and people are just, you know, so curious about this. Yes. Well, I, yeah, I hope, and I hope, you know, even though we focus so much on Mormonism, I think there's a lot of common denominators here, you know, to a lot of other, you know, either evangelical faiths or Catholicism or, more Orthodox Judaism. I mean, obviously there's differences, but a lot of the principles of how we deal with religious values in general um, Mm -hmm. and these sexual principles, I think, you know, there can be a lot of common denominators there for sure. Yeah. Well, just so you know, you have an open invitation to this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) How lovely. Yeah. If you, if you ever feel like, oh, you know, this is something we could have talked about, or if you come across anything, please reach out to me. And I, of course, will do the same. You're right. welcome to reject me at any point. That's fine. But I have found this to be incredibly valuable. So thank you so much for your time, your willingness. I know that your time is very valuable and you're all over the place and you're very wanted these days. <laughs> you're very desired. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that you'd spend time with us is very meaningful to me. So thank you. You're more than welcome. We took the long road home Turned minutes into miles And as the evening traveled on The sunset bathed your smile We stopped beneath the desert stars Wrapped in each other's arms Was as simple as I love you And ordinary, extraordinary Sometimes we fell apart We always came back home Was as simple as I love you An ordinary, extraordinary Let's take 
together until we're gone. Watch it by my side till the day I die. And into the beyond. It's as simple as our love is. That's how I wanna go. All wrapped up in the arms of our extraordinary. It's nothing hard to marry love. Ordinary. Ordinary. No, it's extraordinary.